Thank you for listening in with me at Seeking Eye. A little bit about myself. My name is Darren, and I use the surname Mac online just for simplicity's sake because my full surname is much more difficult to remember. I established the Seeking Eye project to research the nature of life, death, and beyond. I have since set up events, interviews, and debates with some of the leading thinkers and researchers on the subjects, the results of which I share freely as discussions or podcast episodes on the Seeking Eye YouTube channel and Podbean profile. Until now, I have funded this project myself, but as the costs of producing and publishing my work have risen, I'm now reaching out for support via DonorBox and Patreon. If you support Seeking Eye monthly through Patreon, you will receive certain rewards depending on which tier you sign up for. You can donate to the project via buttons which you will find online at seeking-i.com. You can also find the links to both of these in the description beneath each YouTube video and Podbean podcast episode. Of course, there is no obligation, but all donations will be gratefully received and used exclusively to improve this project. Thank you very much. It's always fascinated me, of course. I mean, uh, I studied chemistry and uh, I know some things about biochemistry and, and, you know, who doesn't want to understand the origin of life. But, um, yeah, I did a little bit of a deeper dive than I had before just because that video kept coming up. People would would uh, come to, you know, I have some biology tutorials that talk about evolution by natural selection. And even though abiogenesis is not actually the same or related really to evolution, um, you get a lot of fundamentalists coming and, and shouting about how impossible all of these natural processes are. Um, and I found that they would all, you know, it, a lot of them would link to uh, evangelists, of course, but then there was this one chemist who kept coming up and they kept linking me to that one video that you're referencing. And I, at least a hundred times I got linked to that video. And so I finally thought, all right, who is this guy? Um, and I just, I sort of dug into the video a little bit and um, he's become sort of the patron saint in abiogenesis denial because he is, he is a chemist, right? So he is a, an actual scientist who understands chemistry. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and he's very emphatic, uh, and, you know, at first glance, you don't really know his background, you know, religious, you know, in terms of his religion and, yeah, and no, everything. He doesn't, he doesn't make that obvious in the video. Right. And for good reason, because, you know, he doesn't want to portray a bias, which he very blatantly has. Um, and so he, he people, this stuff is very, very hard to understand. And so... Uh, if you have a bias, if you have a personal bias, you are going to tend to uh, ascribe uh, uh, tr uh, a higher level of truth to someone who you perceive as having expertise in an area. And and it's true that s somebody like Jim who understands organic chemistry has a much better capacity to understand origin of life research than a layperson. Nevertheless, he does not perform origin of life research and he does not truly understand it. Um, but, uh, that's why you get these arguments from authority, uh, where it's like, okay, this one guy says it's impossible. So it must be impossible because he's a chemist. Um, but his art, you know, he sort of argues that being an organic chemist, he must be an expert on biological systems. This is, uh, this is blatantly false, right? What he does has nothing to do with biological systems. He makes tiny molecular machines. So this is analogous, as I said in my video, to a particle physicist saying that they must be the best at understanding organic chemistry because molecules are made of atoms, which are made of subatomic particles, right? So it, Jim, Jim's ignorance in the field, he, he overestimates his expertise because yes, he does understand molecules, but you know, these are biological systems that he, he doesn't really um, understand. And he kind of over and over and over again, just says, we're clueless, we're clueless, we're clueless. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how any of this could have happened. There's no, not been any relevant research since the Miller-Urey experiment, um, which is blatantly false. I mean, every year there are incredible papers put out on origin of life research. So I just wanted to make a video, not necessarily aimed at tour, directly but more aimed at people who uh cite that video and yeah. say look here you go abiogenesis silver bullet not possible sorry um everything he says is it's just not a valid talking point and i wanted to deconstruct all of his talking points so that's what it did <laughs>
I don't know what kind of headspace he must be in because in the, in recent years he's gotten a lot of pushback from the scientific community uh, just because you know at first fine you have some religious views nobody's nobody no scientists are going to try to encroach any religious views but then he got more and more outspoken and he started partnering with the Discovery Institute and he goes on these like talking these like speaking tours for creationist audiences where he just spews kind of like anti-science drivel not not just about chemistry like anti-evolution you know stuff that he really doesn't know anything about and actually one time he he really severely publicly mocked uh jack shostak who's like a, a very well-respected nobel prize winning uh scientist who, who researches origin of life and you know it was a fiasco everyone was like dude you can't talk like this like you're you're you know and then he issued a public apology but you know because he had to he was caught yeah. uh, you know talking that way and so I don't really know. I mean, I know that the scientific community regards him as uh, is he, he he's lost a lot of credibility. I, I don't really know what his standing is at, at Rice University anymore. I mean, I, I imagine they're probably embarrassed of his behavior, but um you know yeah. And I mean, you know, no disrespect to to Dr. Talks, I'm sure that he knows you know, his his own subject incredibly well. Um, yeah. and you know, having a difference of opinion, a different of scientific opinion is is fine, but you know, I'm very, very strongly against coming out as you say he did ridiculing other people and right you no know, really threatening because to me that's just not necessary in science and and you know this discovery of knowledge because it's not it's just not necessary yeah he's just winning points with with a creationist audience you know and and yeah if he gave a lecture on on um on nanomaterials or you know building molecular machines i would gladly listen because he is an expert in that field but you know, it's, 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 he's just a classic example of how religion poisons the mind because he, he, he's not Kent Hovind, right? He's not some, some con artist evangelist uh, spewing fundamentalist rhetoric. He's a scientist and, and he's a smart and in, he's an intelligent, rational person. And yet his, his indoctrination Right, with his, directly within his field of research, because building his molecular machines does not challenge his faith, he has no problem, and, and he's able to be a productive scientist. But then, when you start talking about a, you know the origin of life and you know uh, uh, all that kind of stuff, where it encroaches on a literal interpretation of scripture, his logical faculties unravel. And he, I mean, I can't imagine the level of cognitive dissonance he must experience on a daily basis because he's a scientist. But he has to believe these things, yeah, um, yeah, as per so, his faith. So, so that yeah. natural that natural bias is going to really feed into the objectivity you face in science, yeah. especially in this sort of subject. Yeah. So, so moving away from from Doctor Tor and actually onto the subject then of, of origin of life, um, mm -hmm. what what are the current dominant theories that are supported? Well, yeah. So this is what I what I explained in the email. I'm probably not like the best guy to explain all of uh, you know abiogenesis research because I not only know a bit about it, um, but a bit uh, is still more than I know. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> I mean, um, so uh, how to attack this? I mean, what you know, we want to understand how the components of biological systems could have come to be. And so obviously first you have small molecules and then these small molecules have to polymerize. Uh, the, the primary constituents of, of biological systems are some uh, biomacromolecules. They're predominantly polymers. So you have proteins, which are polymers of amino acids. You have nucleic acids, which are polymers of nucleotides. Uh, and then you have polysaccharides, which are uh, uh, polymers of monosaccharides. And then you have uh, lipids, which are not polymers, but those are the four classes and so, um, I mean, everybody cites the uh, Miller-Urey experiment as like a classic uh, early experiment in the field that sort of pioneered the field. Um, and so this was an experiment that, that simulated early Earth uh, conditions and took basic uh, molecules like uh, ammonia, methane, water, which we know are very abundant all over the universe. We can see that these molecules are everywhere um, and uh, used a spark to simulate uh, lightning and uh, and we got amino acids. So this was a demonstration that um, it is very, very easy for for simple biomolecules like amino acids to, to form spontaneously. Uh, so that's no problem. We've got amino acids. Then we want to understand how um, 
uh, nucleotides and amino acids can polymerize uh, to form, you know, RNA, DNA, uh, proteins. And so obviously this is a big challenge. Um, and this is the area where a lot of people like to try to, in ignorance, attack the field because they'll say things like, um, okay, so we've got, everybody knows we've got DNA in all of our cells, right? Uh, well, proteins build DNA, but DNA is the code for proteins. So this is a seeming, uh, this is seemingly this t terrible paradox, yeah, you know, yeah. one builds the other. Um, and so how do we just, you know, how do we rectify this? But, um, you know, thankfully a lot of work has been done over the past decade. So we, we know that, um, ribonucleotides can polymerize spontaneously to form, uh, ribonucleic acids. So uh, just, just briefly for those of us that aren't uh, overly scientifically literate, sure, sure. could you define the term polymerize for us? Oh, polymerize means you've got one little chunk and then they go dink, 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 like beads on a string. Uh, sorry, I should have explained that. So, yeah, so That's a polymer right. is many monomers linked. So like uh, uh, so like DNA is a polymer because we've got uh, A, C, G, and T. And it's a long st string of A, G, G, C, T, 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 whatever. Uh, and then proteins as well. There are 20 amino acids, and then proteins are just combinations of those 20 amino acids in a long, long, long chain. Um, and so the, this, uh, we, we are very confident that the, that the first thing to polymerize were these uh, ribonucleotides uh, to, to form RNA. Uh, uh, this has been demonstrated to happen uh, spontaneously in, on hot clay. So you, you can talk about uh, hydrothermal vents, you can talk about uh, tidal pools. Uh, I like to talk about the tidal pool hypothesis because number one, it makes it a very small, it sort of simulates a chemistry flask. Uh, this tiny volume where where uh, molecules can sort of find each other and react. It also offers an organometallic surface, right? You've got minerals in the rocks. And um, we've learned in our study of organometallic uh, catalysis that um, that that uh, these transition certain transition metals have these incredible properties that can catalyze these organic reactions. So we use this in the lab all the time to do chemistry, but you know, a mineral surface, could feasibly have catalyzed the reactions. But, so there's a lot uh, to talk about there. But um, to keep it simple, uh, once there uh, once there is RNA, we are also aware of uh, things called ribozymes, which are uh, RNA molecules that can catalyze uh, that can catalyze chemical reactions. So once you have ribozymes, the ribozymes can build things. So number one, they can build proteins. And so now you have this po this possibility of building uh, endless uh, proteins in in a specific fashion, and ribozymes have also shown to have uh, autocatalytic uh, or, uh, so, uh, or they are self-replicative uh, properties. So ribozymes can self-replicate. So already in this first uh, rudimentary stage, we've got molecules that can build other molecules and can build themselves. Yeah. So from there, I mean. It depends how esoteric you want to get. You know, there uh, you you've got um, hypercycles, which are just like uh, a series of some number of molecules that uh, replicate themselves and the next molecule in the cycle. So these have been, de I think, uh, 2012 or something. There, this was demonstrated, um, and then uh, you know, lipids uh, lipids self-assemble into into vesicles just due to the um, due to the amphiphilic nature so i mean again i could talk for 10 minutes on each thing but just lipids come together to form these little vesicles they trap organic molecules inside um and then from there it's just off to the races so once you know these molecules uh you know we, if we're produced if um if if ribozymes are producing proteins you have all these different proteins natural selection uh comes into play right a any molecule that uh, can better, that can more efficiently self-replicate or produce some molecule that assists in the, in the replication is going to be favored statistically. That's just, it's basic statistical dynamics. Uh, and then, you know, uh, metabolic activity comes about slowly. You've got this protocell. Um, and then over a billion years, at least you maybe 2 billion years, you get to the complexity of what life is now. So I think the main detractors look at something like a bacterium and say, wow, I mean, well, first of all, some of them look at an animal cell or a eukaryotic cell and say, wow, how incredibly complex. Yeah, it's very, very complex. That's not what life looked like when it started. No, absolutely. Yeah. Not. 
even a bacterium, which is much, much simpler, being a prokaryotic cell, is still tremendously more complex than what the first protocell must have been. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd like to do a lot of work in just sort of dismantling that straw man. And uh, we're, we're making incredible strides with Origin of Life Research, uh, showing what sort of system that first protocell could have been, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. Yeah, hmm. and if you're wondering why I've just gone very yellow, it's because my uh, my monitors have a, a blue oh. light filter that comes on at nine o'clock, so that's that's why. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's one thing I did pick up from from Doctor Tour as well. We should <laughs> going back to to his video is he did mention about that we don't have any idea how to make the most basic of organisms um, that exist currently. But as you as you rightly said, and as I something yeah. I picked up on, that's not exactly what life would have been like at its very very early stages. So I mean, mm -hmm. a, a question that I that I'd have is how would you define, or, or what would you say is effectively the difference between living matter and non living matter? So there are a few criteria for classifying something as a living organism. Um, uh, number one, uh, self replication course uh number two response to stimuli growth uh it has to be sort of a dynamic system and most importantly um there, there has to be metabolic activity there has to be there has to be chemistry happening right that that's sort of why uh i like to talk about that when people uh in discussing things like viruses so viruses are not classified as living organisms uh because they're they're inert they're they're chemically inert they're just sort of these floating sacks of genetic material um right yeah whereas so they need, any, yeah yeah any cellular system there's in every cell in your body there's all these chemical reactions happening all the time so that's life it's it's a dynamic system i'm sure a biologist could offer a slightly uh a better definition but um to me so, there's stuff going on you know so would you say then that um if i'm I'm saying you're right that viruses aren't classified as living beings, I suppose, because they need, they rely on, on other matter in order to replicate and to really establish themselves. Correct. And, and even more importantly, they just, they don't, it's not a dynamic system. They're inert systems. It's just some genetic material in a protein casing floating around aimlessly. Mm. And if it by chance, uh, a, a viral protein interacts with a receptor on a potential host cell, it gets brought into the cell and then the cellular machinery does the replication. But it's just uh, it's just this inert, lifeless pod, essentially. Whereas a bacterium, there's a lot going on inside of a bacterium. There's chemistry happening all the time because uh, a viral particle does not require energy because it is it does not expend any energy. It doesn't right. do anything. But a bacterium yeah. does stuff, right? It has to generate ATP so that it can so that it can, uh, you know, do do the stuff that it does, um, and so um, I, I'm definitely not. I, I definitely don't know too much about what research has been going on in terms of demonstrating what sort of uh, primitive metabolic capabilities would could have arisen first. I'm not really familiar with the, you know, in depth with the research there. Um, but you know, the studies of, of uh, the studies of hypercycles have shown that the first, uh, you know, it, it's very plausible that the first, um, polymerase enzymes or enzymes in general came about that way. So proteins that go do very specific, uh, chemical reactions within a, within a system mm. and also the first rudimentary genomes. So, so, so DNA came about after the fact. Uh, so, so uh, RNA is the was the first genetic material essentially. So, so life predates DNA. Life came first, then DNA, um, and right. that's something that a lot of people have trouble with because they they you know they hear since second grade DNA is the is the genetic code of life. DNA yeah. is the genetic code of life, and yeah, it's the genetic genetic code of of life that exists complex now. Life. yeah yeah so so you'd yeah. say that the um that the um i suppose the fundamental materials that comprise dna are themselves living the fun oh no no uh, that comprise dna itself so uh, that would yeah. just be nucleotides so no a, a nucleotide would not be alive but, so when um, you say so when you say that dna proceed uh, is life proceeds dna what would that life be so RNA based, RNA, -based. Uh, RNA would be right. would have been okay. the genetic material. So the the differences between RNA and DNA, uh, number one is RNA is single stranded, 
So DNA is the double helix. Um, and then other uh, very small uh, discrepancies in structure. But um, the, 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 this, this problem that people have with DNA codes for proteins, but proteins uh, you know, synthesize DNA, um, that problem, uh, th they're not understanding that RNA can have come first and synthesized proteins. So it went RNA, proteins, DNA. DNA, and I see. Once you and have they, proteins right. and DNA, then you're all set. And there were life forms that could, that were sustained only by RNA or that Correct. were comprised only. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my channel mainly focuses on something very different, which is kind of philosophy of mind and consciousness and all that sort of thing. But, mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting to me as to how you as to how the properties of life come about from ultimately unconscious matter in yeah. say our in rna um i mean i am very <laughs> uneducated in this subject i haven't done chemistry since you know end of high school mm -hmm. um so how do we do we know how we get from unconscious matter in rna to a system that has has the functions of life, the self-replication, um, the metabolism. I, I don't know if that's the case, but you, you mm -hmm. know what I mean. How, how well, do we? Well, life and consciousness are two very, very, very different things. Um, I would argue that the vast majority of life is not conscious. Co conscious. Uh, I think consciousness is a very complex uh, complex phenomenon. That uh, you know, I'm a reductionist, so I still maintain that it is uh, a product of, of physical systems, physical reality, and, and not anything supernatural. But um, uh, the brain, the human brain, is overwhelmingly more complex than a, a, a unicellular organism. So uh, I, I, the, the interesting thing about it is, the more you learn about chemistry and biochemistry, the more that you can look at something as simple as at, at the very least a unicellular organism as just an automaton so y you you can see everybody's seen like a like bacteria or or different kind of protists moving around in like a microscope or something right they're kind of they're moving around and and they ascribe it sentience because we move and we are sentient so it should follow that anything that moves is sentient it's not true. Uh, there are actually very specific chemical mechanisms. There's phototaxis, chemotaxis. These are chemical reactions that, are, that occur in response to uh, a gradient of molecules or light. So phototaxis is motion in response to light. Chemotaxis is motion in response to a gradient of molecules. And so it, when a bacterium moves in a particular direction, when a flagellum goes like this and it goes over there, it is literally chemical reactions. It's not a mystery. We know the reactions. We know what they are very well. We understand them very well. And so uh, I look at that and I see an automaton. I see a, a machine. And that sometimes I can observe even like a house fly. And I kind of think of it that way too. I can kind of see how it is a mindless machine. Obviously, somewhere in between a house fly and a human being, there's a line where I can no longer see it that way because I have a hard time viewing myself that way. I certainly feel as though I have free will, whether I do or don't, I'm not sure. But um, where that line is, where we have to start to examine what consciousness is and how that arises, it's an interesting question. I don't know it much is. about that's it myself. Char but. Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness, and that's where you start yeah. to get different philosophies like idealism and panpsychism yeah. and various different things, which, how well would I define myself? I don't know. Probably... I mean, I, I very much like the ideas of, I don't know if you know of him, Bernardo Kestrup. Mm. He's, he's a, he calls himself as a metaphysical idealist. To describe his position would be difficult for me because I struggle to get my head around it. But it's essentially yeah. something like everything is derived from mental process or from a mind of some sort outside of what we understand as, mm. as reality. I'd, it, it, I'd, I'd be absolutely butchering it, but I, his ideas are very interesting. And I, I must admit that I... I don't believe, as you do, that the brain cre creates consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it acts more as like a f a f some sort of filtering mechanism for some a conduit. Of, yeah, for some sort of um, part of nature that we haven't yet understood. Would I say it's supernatural? I'd say it's just an undiscovered part of the natural world. Mm -hmm. But um, can I? Do I know that for sure? No, absolutely not. How, how can mm -hmm. we? We haven't got any way of measuring anything like that. Right. But that's that, that's 
you know the evidence I've seen the research I've done that's where I am I may very well be wrong um, but again that is a whole other question and a very difficult very difficult thing to ever really even I mean how can, how can you run experiments for that sort of thing right um, so abiogenesis could, could you describe briefly what the idea of abiogenesis is and what what, what are its um, what are the positions that oppose it uh, well, it's the origin of life from non-living matter, and um, there are no credible scientific positions that oppose it. I mean, the opposition is is exclusively from people who don't like the idea because it challenges their faith, uh, quite frankly. Um, there's not really anyone in the scientific community. I mean, that, that's the funny thing about it, is that people who, who vehemently um, oppose the idea of abiogenesis and are very outwardly, out, or who are very outspoken in their disapproval are across the board fundamentalists uh, with the occasional, uh, or sorry, they're, they're almost completely across the board uneducated fundamentalists who have zero capacity to comprehend uh, chemistry or biochemistry or biology with the occasional exception of someone like James Tour, who is an educated fundamentalist. Right, so he does understand chemistry, but he's still a fundamentalist. You never, ever, ever see a completely secular, atheistic biochemist speaking in the way that Jim does, you know, saying we have no idea and it's it's impossible and it's just ridiculous that you, people would think this. Um, no, because biochemists understand biological systems and they understand biochemistry and they understand the components of life and they go, uh, I mean, for, for someone with that level of comprehension, that is not, uh, that doesn't have any, any, uh, fundamentalism to reconcile with. Um, it's very clear that there are many, many pathways by which this could have occurred. And it's just that we don't know precisely what happened, but we are, we are outlining uh, several different possibilities for how certain polymers could have come about, mm -hmm. where chirality could have come into the mix, etc. So when fundamentalists say like, oh, you know, you guys admit it, you don't even know what happened. It's like, yeah, we don't know what happened, but it's like, Let's say you come over to my house. How did you get to my house? Did you take the freeway? Did you take the side streets? Did you ride your bike? Did you walk? I don't know how you got here, but you, you got here. And the fact that you that I don't know which way you went doesn't mm -hmm. mean that I'm like, it's magic. You just appeared at my house. <laughs> like you came one way. I don't know which way, but these are all very possible ways yeah. that you could have gotten to my house. Yeah. So, um, and the dissenter, you know, the, the people who are outspoken 999 out of a thousand they just they don't even know what dna is they don't know what proteins i mean they don't even have the basic 10th grade level vocabulary to be even discussing these things they're just triggered by science because it encroaches on their faith and that's mm. really the bottom and, line and i mean having you know having a, a certain faith is is fine to me um, for for day to day life, but when we come in at subjects that are really looking at the or, you know important questions like the origin of life and and the origin of the universe and the general mechanisms of how reality works, you know they have to be put aside in the in the light of new evidence and new information. If it suggests you know, the whole thing, the whole point of science is to develop, and as evidence well, comes about, we must be open to to change our worldview if if it's contradicted. That sounds like a very rational way to operate. Unfortunately, fundamentalism runs contrary to rationality. So uh, that's not how a lot of people think. But yeah, you know, I mean, um, it, it's science. It's a it's perpetual yeah. work in progress. I mean, looking at my position now, I was brought up as, as an atheist. And I, I had, I mean, would you still class me as an atheist? I don't believe in any religious god. If there is a god, I think it's, uh, as I say, some part of nature that's certainly not well, not been well described yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always brought up to think that, you know, once you die, you die, because that was my main focus of research. And I no longer think that because of the evidence I've seen. And that was a big kind of change in, in worldview for me. It was probably down to some biases because I have death anxiety. I'm frightened to death of death, I suppose. Well, you welcome to, to humanity. That. We all have exactly, death anxiety. Exactly. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, that, that, and I don't deny there was probably biases involved, but as I've done more research, I've, I've come to establish that that's, that there is some kind of possibly some truth in that. And this is, you know, doing this sort of research, having talks like, like this really does 
shape my own worldview. I mean, the idea of abiogenesis and, and things like that, now that we know that there is evidence for it, as you say, you know, spontaneous um, creation of these, um, I forget what you call them, but of these molecules on clay, is certainly very strong evidence to suggest that abiogenesis can be true. So what I would glean from that then is not to say, no, it doesn't exist because it doesn't fit in my worldview. You then say, right, well, how does this fit into my worldview? Does it? And if it doesn't, that might need adjusting because we know this happens and it needs to fit in somehow. If that means changing my worldview, so be it. And um, whether it does or not, I don't know. I, I, I don't imagine it, it does, but I'd have to really think about it. But that's to me how it should be thought of. You know, you see the evidence. The evidence is primarily taking you it is dictating where your worldview goes and not the opposite. If only everyone uh, thought that way. <laughs> <laughs> but so you've arrived, you've arrived at a belief in the afterlife. How did yeah. you well, fall into that? That, that would take, that, that's a long one. Um, as I say, it started off with <clears throat> um, an anxiety disorder caused by, sorry, <clears throat> caused by a huge fear of death. And then that led, led me to depression and various things. It's a long thing, but, but ultimately the, then, um, I was kind of pushed into the idea of anomalous experiences of consciousness. When I say pushed in, it was mainly, you know, the depression was really make, giving me an interest in this sort of thing. If I was going to, knowing that I'm going to die, I, I want to know what's going to happen. So I started looking at it, and you see all these different anomalous experiences like um, the near-death experience, um, veridical out-of-body perception, sigh, which I'm, um, I'm on the fence, um, and various other phenomena like that, after-death communication, and initially my thought was, you know, near-death experiences are chemically induced hallucinations or lack of oxygen in the dying brain. Yeah. Uh, Out-of-body experiences are, you know, lucid, same as lucid dreams. We know they occur. It's going to be the same as that. Uh, what else did I say? After death communication, you know, when, when someone dies, we're in grief, we're going to see things. We'd expect that. But then when I looked a bit more into the data and the, and the, um, the work done on it, and I started talking to some of these people, you know, I've spoken to some of the leading researchers in the world on these things, and listening to them, their data, if, if it's taken as what I would consider an, an objective approach, without presupposing that it must be wrong, it has actually, in my opinion, a pretty strong basis for, for, for argument in, in favour of, I wouldn't say an afterlife, but I'd say that death isn't exactly what we think it is. Hmm. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it's my, it's my interpretation of the data I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an interesting subject, and I think there's no bigger question than what's going to... I mean, imagine if, if people knew that, for certain, that death isn't the complete cessation of, of consciousness. You know, I think that would be a, a... That would take away a hell of a lot of stress and worry in people's lives. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I struggle with this because, you know, I, I'm... You know, I'm, I, it's not like I'm completely fearless of death. I'm a little bit afraid no, to die. Nobody is. No, but... Um, what you just said, uh, what did you just say? Fearing uh, non non-existence or something like that, right? What did you say? Well, <laughs> I don't know exactly, I, but effectively, the, the yeah. fear of never existing again, never being conscious again. Right for now, now consider the fear of existing perpetually, infinitely into the future. Mm -hmm. Is is that terrifying to you? Yes, but there is a presupposition. Yeah. There is a presupposition there, though. And what? that's presupposing that the experience of time after death is the same as we experience it here. Okay. Many people who have anomalous experiences of consciousness in near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, and this is completely not the subject I thought we were going to be talking about, which hopefully no, it's no interesting, um, <laughs> is that time is completely... I mean, it's outside of time. I mean, to imagine what that existence must be is... We can't imagine it. It's like yeah, imagining a new colour, you know. I mean, if that even means anything. It may, that may not have exactly. any physical meaning at all. But no. to me, it, it, like, I, I... A lot changed for me when I sort of understood, okay, the two options are that you die or that you never, ever die. And to me, the latter is oh, way yeah. scarier. Yeah, and yeah. so once you accept a finite existence... Then you start to say, well, if it's finite, then, you know, a hundred years, a million years, I mean, it, it, it's simply the acceptance that there's an end point. And then once you can accept that there is, that there must be an end point, okay, then that end point is the human lifetime. I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't mind living a lo little longer. Let's see if we can mm. extend this, this bad boy. But, yeah. um, 
and I'll, and as I'll you, be as you on, say, on you know, board for that. But yeah, as you say, the idea of existing perpetually forever. I don't know why I said perpetually. I don't even know if that's the <laughs> right word, but I will just put it in there. Yeah, for the, for the sake yeah, of it. Um, whether existing forever on a in a in the same experience of time that we have here is an absolutely terrifying thought. I wouldn't want that. Nobody would want that. I don't think. Yeah, but. <clears throat> You know, the experience of people that have been to a state where, and the, you know, the strongest levels of evidence to me are this, these experiences where allegedly the brain was completely flat on mm -hmm. the EEG measurement with no measurable, you know, no reasonably demonstrable activity that would give rise to consciousness. When they have had these experiences where they've said, they've never mentioned anything about a sense of, of time the same way here. I suppose it's something you'd have to experience yourself to understand, but um, you know they've said they lived. They were, I mean, time it didn't. There was no. I mean, even trying to explain it in in language is difficult. But ev yeah. everything existed at once, and and nothing existed as well at the same time. And it's how the hell these people brains don't blow up after they've had these experiences I don't know <laughs> but it, you know and this is millions of people have all said the same thing and they've apparently had these experiences while in a time when their brain was not functioning properly and there are arguments mm -hmm. against why that could be that, that are reasonable um, but yeah as you say you know existing forever would be a terrifying thought and I certainly would I think death would be better as in yeah. the cessation I I view death as a release from the stresses of consciousness. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose it's something everyone wonders, what is it like to go to sleep mm -hmm. and never wake up again? I mean, th you know, this is the human condition, is that we're, we're, as far as I know, the only species that can, con that can grasp the concept of infinity, uh, finitude and infinity, and, and lament that we are not infinite. Um, but we drive ourselves up the wall about it. You know, we always are thinking, you know, what is infinity and why am I not it? Um, but that's just the human condition to me. You know what mm. I mean? I think mm. it produces mm. some spectacular art, but in the end, we're all in the ground, you know, yeah. not, not experiencing and, a damn thing. Hmm. And that's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, but. It, who knows? Who nobody knows at the end of the day what happens mm -hmm. after we die. We no one can know, and anyone that says they do know is just ignore them <laughs> because that's yeah. not science, you know. <laughs> um, so, moving back on topic, I suppose. Sure. Um, so, what? What? How do the re religious fundamentals, as you say, how do they manage to get around this empirical evidence that we have? If you say that, you know. We've seen that RNA can form spontaneously on on hot clay, and that's demonstrable. Well, and how very, do they get around? They get around it very easily by ignoring it because they have no idea what any of that means. It's it's gibberish to them. They don't know what uh, you know RNA polymerization. They don't know what uh, you know what. Like you could say any basic scientific terminology, and it's a foreign language to them. I mean, they just and and they're they're basically by. In ignoring the entirety of science, they essentially are going up to two people speaking Chinese and saying, "You're not speaking a, a language because I don't understand what you're saying." I mean, that's that's the, the that's how bold they are in their in in projecting their ignorance onto the human race. It's like, look, I if you don't understand science, that's fine. That doesn't bother me. There are plenty of people who don't understand science. And if you say, "Hey, I don't understand." Or this origin of life business i don't understand it perfectly perfectly acceptable thing to state but then to just say none of what you guys do matters because i don't like it and i don't i don't want to try to put in the effort to try to understand what it is that you do so with origin of life i mean that's why i didn't talk about it or I, I, I it took me a long time to 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 try to make any content on origin of life or abiogenesis uh, on my channel just because the target audience it's so futile because they don't understand 10th grade chemistry, let alone this stuff that I barely grasp myself with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. You know, um, it, you know, it, it's it's really, really hard to understand, you know, and um, I, I, I pride myself in being pretty good at breaking down complex information as simply and succinctly as possible. So I, I did eventually rise to the challenge and I made 
a 45 minute piece, what I think is both addressing uh, the main, you know, deconstructing the, the main talking points of people who are detractors and also very briefly summarizing origin of life research. And I was pretty, pretty proud of the piece, but um, it just, it doesn't even scratch the surface because how can you, I mean, you, you need to have studied this stuff for a long time to have any hope. I mean, I, I pull up one of these papers and my, you know, I get a blank stare on my face go for a few minutes. It's just, a, it's hard. It's really hard to dig into these papers, you know? And the same can be said for literally all scientific research, any, any field of science, you know, this is what lay people are having to deal with now because of what happened in the 20th century. The 20th century was this enormous explosion of scientific progress in every single field, physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, geology, mathematics, you name it, every field, it just went it just ballooned up into this thing of immense scope such that there's nobody alive. There's no more Benjamin Franklin's. There's no more Leonardo da Vinci's. There's never again going to be somebody who can like contribute to this field, contribute to that field, etc. It's too late. It, it's too big. People are specialists in a subfield of a subfield of a subfield of science. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just the human race knows so much. And when you don't know any science, it's tempting to just cast the whole thing aside and say, oh, that's not real, you know, while using the technology that science has provided you yeah. on a daily yeah. basis. So, and uh, I mean, in, in the kind of the fields that I not not study, because I'm not, God, I'm nowhere near that level, but the sorts of things that I share, there's there's a lot of, materialist materialism bashing you know people whenever they bring forth an idea of materialism people are on them and saying you know oh, that's a, such a um you know an old belief grow up you know we know this we know that spiritual spiritual and it happens on both sides but you think you know well yeah i mean materialism is definitely not complete and especially with the mind brain question it it faces big big questions with that but you know You've, you've got these and you've got these yeah. and thanks to and you, you eat and you drink because of materialism because we right. understand it we understand how to build these things we understand why it's important to eat and why it's important to drink and you know every, whenever you're ill we know how to deal with that because of materialism so to, so you know to to say it's limited and it, it struggles and it will struggle to answer these big questions is one thing but saying it's completely childish of a thought or, or of a philosophy or completely useless is is not true and it's equally the other side you know people that say idealism or panpsychism are, are baseless or useless you know they might be to some degree but they pose very interesting answers to some of these questions that are worth looking into mm -hmm. and, and not discounting out offhand yeah and people yeah, call me a useless are different words certainly yeah baseless I mean, perhaps not necessarily useless <laughs> but, and people um, would call would call me a scientific illiterate or you know a, a non-critical thinker or a wishful thinker because of the things i believe but you know to but you're, say you're that, not you're not dogmatically anti-science you know what i mean that's no. that's a very key distinction you you are able to say okay these people did this science so that exists and i have to I'll make space in my worldview for the existence of that science and the implications of that science. So that's a key thing that I really wish everyone in the world was was capable of because it would be wouldn't have this rampant science denial and the immense sociological ramifications that are tearing our society apart, you know. Yeah. And I mean there's no no denying that things like religion are or have been beneficial to the human race. I mean, it's been incredibly harmful in some ways, but incredibly beneficial in another. You know, people have found a sense of community. You know, some of the best artwork and, and things have all been religiously based. You know, some of the cathedrals that are built are amazing. Well, I that's mean, science, we'll, science helped them that's build. That's paying the bills. You know, true. when the money is coming from from the church, the art is true, church true. related. But I mean, but, you know, uh, the, the point the point being, there have been benefits, um, and you know, some of these very outspoken atheist um activists will deny that but that's to me there are yeah. benefits there are harms but there are also benefits and I mean, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to erase religion from human history i i don't know that it's possible that we could have gotten here without it but um but uh i i want to encourage 
uh, humanity to to take this step into adolescence and shed the um, the fairy tales that it once mm. possessed. Mm. <laughs> um, and I mean, as you say, if we follow that kind of idea and try to limit the biases and the I'd, what I'd say obviously untrue <laughs> um, claims of religion, if we can mm-hmm. drop those and really focus on what is what is research or what is what is discoverable i think yeah. in the next in the next couple hundred years people will be looking back on our scientific discoveries and laughing at the sheer you know um the primitiveness the primitiveness of it sure. yeah i mean this is why you guys didn't even is... understand what consciousness is you moron. exactly that, that's but, that's um, my that's my yeah. thought you know I mean, people i don't i don't have any problem with you know the the, the uh, a religious person whose worldview does not infringe on science is not is not problematic to me you know I, I don't go around saying oh do you believe in god oh you idiot like you know not exactly yeah. i don't yeah. care if somebody is is theistic and believes in a god that does not contradict science in any way shape or form you know if you believe there's a god that triggered the beginning of the universe i don't care fine um but the earth is not six thousand years old so sorry if that's what you believe you're wrong and stop brainwashing people to make money mm. you know? i think that's the thing uh, isn't it is is that is the damage of religion is when it's f- forced onto i mean whether it's evidential or not if it's forced onto somebody especially a, a childhood at a very young age and it's forced onto them that's mm-hmm. to me that that's not fair you know that person should no. grow up in the society that they're raised in and make up their own mind i mean people that yeah. that openly and the worst thing is when not when science is denied to me but when it's misrepresented in favor of someone's beliefs yeah that, which that, is all that the time frustrates me which is all the time both because i mean the because evangelists don't understand science at all anyway so sometimes it's just that they don't understand it and then some are just maliciously misrepresenting it um but um yeah i mean <laughs> they don't even understand all none of these evangels every single talking point they have i'm just like dude you're supposed to learn this in ninth grade like 14 year old children understand this and you don't mm-hmm. like uh, when this when this worldview is is um served to someone from birth that's their logical framework it's very hard to get out of that some people do some people don't mm-hmm. and um, well, it becomes their nature doesn't it yeah that's the lens with which you view the world. I mean, I, I feel very thankful that I grew up in, in a complete vacuum of religion. It just wasn't brought up at all. There was no, uh, th- I mean, it, th- nobody said, there's no God. People say that there's a God, but there isn't. They don't, nobody said that to me. And nobody said, hey, here's this God with a beard and he wants you to do these things. And here's this special stories. I didn't hear any of that. And so uh, when I was like five or six and I started hearing it from the outside world going to school i was just so perplexed and i greeted it immediately with the disbelief and skepticism that i still have today because it just sounded like what it was made up bullshit (laughs) you know what i mean i just immediately was like what you you believe what why do you believe that it just sounded like somebody took like lord of the rings or harry potter or something and like you know made this uh construct around it i was like I don't know what you're saying at all. <laughs> it's just mm, so strange mm, to me. It was a similar so. situation. A similar situation for me. You know, I was never brought up with religion, and when I was four, uh, which is the age we start school over here, I was um, put in a Church of England school, which is I don't know what you call it over there, but a Christian school. Yeah. Because it was literally a thirty second walk from our house, and we were told to pray. You know, we had to pray every morning, just before lunch, just after lunch, and before we went home, and also in assemblies. And yeah, you know, we'd pray a lot. And I was just like you sat there thinking, this doesn't make sense at all. You know, mm-hmm. God made Adam and then made Eve from a rib, and then made the, the made whole, Adam from dust. By the way, made Adam from dust. Yeah, and made the earth in six days, and he said, and let there be light, rest. and there was light. Yeah, he and then he had tired. to rest on the seventh day. Yeah, and I mean that's one thing that I would God be tired? I mean, if he's this all-powerful, all, but I, I don't know. I mean, whether there's any evidence to support Christianity or not, you know, the apologists will say there is, and they'll well, provide not, it. Others will say there isn't. Not a literal interpretation. You're insane if you think that a literal interpretation of the Bible. A literal is interpretation. Just, you're absolutely insane. As to people who 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 take the Bible as allegory, 
fine. You know what I mean? You can do that with Aesop's fables. You can do it with the Bible. If you pray in a meditative fashion, fine. You know, anybody can pray. You can do, you can do, you can pray, you can do yoga, you can do whatever you want. You know what I mean? I, I don't have any problem. The, the humans are, are very odd organisms and we have, we like rituals and we like these constructs and, and, and we like stories and we look at all these things. And if you have your rituals and you have your stories, have have those things i don't have any problem i'm not going to try to strip them from you but the moment you start um saying my stories are true and therefore i get to infringe on your rights or i get to yeah. dictate how yeah, society goes nope mm. get out of here you do not get to do that yeah. because guess what what you believe is wrong you can still believe it if you want to mm. but it's not true see so. I, I think i would take a different approach I, I wouldn't say that they even you know someone who believes the bible literally i wouldn't immediately say that they're wrong because I, I would, I, I can't. I've never, I was never brought up with that information. I've never read the Bible. I've never researched it. They may have evidence that I don't. They may. I don't know. So I, you know, if you believe in, it, in that, literally, so be it. You know, I, I have complete respect for that. But if you then go on to deny what we do know, yeah, that that's when it becomes a problem. Especially if you've, you know, if if, if we've given you the resource, you know, look up this website and have a read, and then you still say. Either refuse to to look at it or say it it doesn't it's it's not true or it's wrong. Then that's when the problem starts. And then if you start you know trying to convert me, <laughs> yeah, that's that's when I I start having well, a problem because that's not their right to do that. But then it's not my the, right to tell them they're wrong either. The willfully ignorant do not seek out information that contradicts their position. This is something I deal with on a daily basis when I get hundreds of people commenting on a video with talking points that I debunked in that video, uh, you know, without having watched it. It's like, dude, press play and watch this. I'm not going to talk to you in the comments section of the video that you didn't watch on something that I talked about in the video. Like, <laughs> it's a very fragile defense mechanism. This guy is going to present yeah. information that contradicts my worldview, which is how I derive my identity. I do not want to experience my identity coming into a question or or having to restructure my identity in any way because I am intellectually lazy. Therefore, I will avoid uh, experiencing this information. That's I mean, it. You, you can understand to some reason why that would be why one would be defensive of, of that sort of thing because if you're brought up with that worldview for so many years, it's like yeah. a it's like a punch to your sense of reality. I certainly understand it, and I certainly sympathize with it, but it is not. That's not enough. You know what I mean? Like be a functioning member of society you know yeah it's grow don't, up don't, it's, yeah don't impose yourself on other yeah don't impose yeah. yourself and your belief on other people let them be you know I, I respect your belief whether i agree with it or not right so respect ours or yeah respect and, mine, you know and my attitude is proportional to the damage that people are doing so i target uh con men you know i target p public figures who 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 lie and who who con other people i would never knock i would never you know go door to door and 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 ask hey what are your beliefs can i now come into your house and tell you how you're wrong mm. you know i don't yeah, no that's that's an imposition do that. of privacy yeah. Mm. yeah i mean it's 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 ineffective in beyond being not a good you know not a nice thing to yeah. do but um you know then these people come to my channel and, and uh you know i'll if you come to my yeah. house, I'll tell you exactly what is the what, you know? Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is it's difficult also to, to criticise people that even would, would do that because in their mind what they're doing is for, for your benefit, you know? I mean, if they are genuinely believing, like the Je uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, uh, will come around and, and tell you about Jesus because they believe that they're helping you find, you know, the, the meaning of life and the true, the true yeah. Lord, which in their mind is a very brilliant thing to do. And it's... Mm -hmm what you deserve and you know for that yeah I, I respect you but please you know if, if i say i'd rather not then let it be and if if you do all power to you i respect that you know mm -hmm. yeah